morning, everyone. Hope you all had a lovely Christmas. Please stand with me as we uh, start our worship with some singing. Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, dry the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea, singing bird and flowing fountain, all us to rejoice in thee. Mortals join the happy chorus, which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward. Victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in the triumph song of life. You may all be seated. All right. Oh, okay. We're here. I wasn't sure if anyone was going to be here this morning. Man, these are the Christians. I am so thankful. I was wondering this whole time, this past year, who are the Christians going to be? And I finally discovered who the Christians are. All those other people that come on Sunday mornings. Well, I don't know about that. So, uh, well, thank you so much for joining us here this morning. My name's Tarl. Uh, and for everyone that is watching on the live stream, I'm hoping that we have the live stream up. Uh, Gus and I have been working on that all morning. This live stream is so sophisticated, so many different numbers, so many different things. But if we are making it out to you, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Else that is here, uh oh, for everyone else that is here, um, just know uh, there's a lot of people that are out and about because it's Boxing Day, a lot of people are traveling, but then as you've been looking at on the church WhatsApp, a lot of people are unwell under the weather. Uh, a lot of people have tested positive for COVID, and this Omicron variant uh, has been getting everyone, and so we have a lot of prayers that we need to send uh, to God uh, on behalf of so many different people, and so uh, we'll be doing that shortly. The second thing is we're doing a little bit more of a family style service because so many people are out, so many volunteers are not able to make it. Uh, so we only have crush and toddlers today. Uh, our primary and secondary we're not having. Uh, and so if anyone needs anything like that, crush and toddlers just back in this room. And then also if anyone needs masks or uh, sanitizer, hand sanitizer, we have plenty of that. And then also the same thing with toilets, you know where they are. I think everyone else has been here before, so um, yeah. All right, this is going to be a good morning. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited about this. We're going to get through it together. Get through it together. All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, go to the Lord in prayer. And let's really offer up uh, really this morning, but then also pray on behalf of so many people that aren't able to be with us here this morning. So join with me in prayer. Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we just praise you. We thank you. Uh, we glorify your name for who you are and what you've done. And uh, most importantly, we glorify you for your great love of sending your son 
uh, to this earth 2,000 years ago. Uh, we're so thankful that uh, we spend the whole month of December just to be able to celebrate that, to celebrate your incarnation, to celebrate what you've done on behalf of mankind uh, to redeem and to reconcile us back to you. Not because we're worthy, it's because we're so unworthy. Uh, you have uh, graciously provided a way, a sacrifice, an atoning sacrifice for all of us. We thank you uh, for your great love on that uh, matter. Lord, we also uh, am so thankful that we're able to meet here uh, this morning. I know a lot of people are unwell, a lot of people are out, uh, and so many people have come out this morning uh, to make it a point, a priority to worship you together. We pray on behalf of all those that aren't able to make it here this morning, Lord, uh, just so, uh, such a difficult time, especially around the holidays. Uh, so many people are unable uh, to make it because they've tested positive for COVID or they've been unwell just from other illnesses. Uh, we pray that you just keep your hand upon them, bless them, bless uh, their lives, uh, keep them safe, keep them healthy, give them a quick recovery. Uh, and Lord, we pray for all those that are traveling or all those that are uh, have family in town. We pray that you just give them an extra special blessing this morning. I pray that as we continue on with this service, that everything we do, whether it's singing, prayer, or giving, or the reading of your word, that we do all these things to your glory. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. All right. We're going to go ahead and turn to uh, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Uh, this is where we're going to be spending the majority of our time this morning. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've had some uh, technical difficulties with the live stream. Hopefully you are getting this. We're just doing a one camera solution uh, right now. All of you guys get to see me in 3D, which is amazing. You guys are beyond blessed. Sorry, Christine, you're not. Looking at me in person. What is happening with the sound? Is this uh, bad? Is it going up and down? Okay, all right. Uh, so turn with me to Luke chapter 2. For everyone that is watching the live stream, though, currently, I do apologize. We're doing the best that we can. Uh, everything crashed as soon as we got started, and so we had to spend the whole time while Jason was playing uh, to get everything back online. So hopefully it's working now. Uh, but um, we are in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to start with verse 22. It says, and when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up, this is Jesus, up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young uh, pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. If you could, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and what we're going to do is we're going to give uh, this time and continue uh, to ask for God's guidance and hand upon the servants. So let's pray. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now asking uh, for your guidance, your direction in all of our lives. We pray uh, that with all the things that are happening, uh, not only in this world, in this country, in our own communities, but just with this service right now, uh, dealing with all the different aspects and technical difficulties, I pray that um, we would really get to the heart of the matter of what we need to be doing, and that is really to be looking to you as the author and finisher of our faith, as the one that sustains us and keeps us, as the one that provides for us and guides us, as the one uh, that saves us and redeems us. I pray that uh, this time will be a time uh, of uh, focus on you and thankfulness towards you. I pray that we can learn from this passage and we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, so as you know, we've been continuing our series on uh, Christmas playlists. What is on your uh, playlist? Uh, we've been going through this uh, series because of uh, the fact that during Christmas time, there's loads and loads of um, songs that are played, Christmas carols, all sorts of different uh, things that we like to get together and sing, uh, and even during our Christmas carol time, and then also uh, just in our Sunday morning worship time, we're reminded of the fact uh, that music is all around us. And so we've been looking at four different songs, and these songs are within the Bible of songs of praise that are biblical songs, hymns of praise to God uh, for praise. The first one we looked at is Mary's song. 
song. This is what we call the Magnificat. The Magnificat is the Latin word for that first song uh, of just giving, uh, magnifying the Lord's name. And this is what Mary did. As a teenager, she found out that she was going to give birth to the Messiah, and she praises God. And through this song, we learn a little bit about who is God. Uh, what does he do? And then we looked at the priest song. This is Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist. And he begins to sing songs of praise as well, blessing not only uh, Mary, but then also uh, Messiah, the Messiah, and then also the fact that uh, giving credence and knowledge to the fact that John the Baptist would be born. And he answers the question of, you know, why do we need God? What is the big problem that we have to deal with? And then we looked at the angels' song, you know, uh, Gloria, you know, glorifying uh, the, uh, the birth of Jesus Christ, how God came. And then today what we're going to be looking at is really an interesting uh, sort of song, a song where uh, we don't really know a lot about this man. We know a few things, uh, but we don't know a lot about this uh, man, Simeon. Simeon, a man that was revealed to him that he would not see death until he saw the Messiah. What a wonderful, what a wonderful um, uh, revelation to him that that is. All right, so um, I remember when, uh, I think it was like 1990, 1991, um, it was all on the news in America, at least where I lived, uh, about a prophecy that had come to pass, that was going to come to pass, and it was going to be the end of the world. It's always a nice thing that you like to hear when you're like 10, 11, 12 years old. I can't remember exactly when it was because it was so outrageous. And uh, this real famous person in America, and maybe it came over here. I don't know. I don't know if you guys keep up with crazy people very much. Um, but he, he did all the predictions and all the different dates. And he says, the end of the world's going to happen on this date, at this hour, at this time. And I remember talking to my parents about that, being freaked out and being like, oh, man, is this actually going to happen? You know, and uh, going to bed and not really realizing, uh, would this be my last night on earth and Jesus was going to come back and it's going to be the end of the world. And then I remember waking up early the next day, right? And, uh, you know, going outside in my pajamas, it was very cold outside, walking out into the middle of the street. And we lived in kind of like, you know, just one of those off roads, you know, uh, from like the main road. And I, and I looked around and there was like nothing going on. There was not even birds that were chirping. And I was like really scared. I was like, oh no, even the birds are gone, you know? And I'm standing outside and I'm looking around, looking around for a good couple of seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, looking around. Uh, and then I'm waiting, no cars, no people, no nothing. And I start to get a little bit scared at first. And then I see a few cars driving by. And then I'm like, oh, Okay, whew. okay, that guy was wrong. And I went back into uh, my house and I got my cereal. And uh, when I think about that, I really think about these predictions that don't come to pass. And how many times of us, we've heard uh, different prophecies, predictions that haven't come to pass. And you may have heard about these different things. And in this day and age, there's all sorts of different charlatans and uh, people that uh, are fake. And they make these predictions and prophecies and saying, these things will come to pass. And then they don't come to pass. And you think, well, why is that? You know, obviously it's not from God. Well, the reason why I bring this up to us today is this man, Simeon, that we're going to be exploring and reading about, he was, uh, it was revealed to him through the power of the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he saw the Messiah. And that is just an incredible sort of prophecy. That's an incredible sort of revelation that was given to him that he would be the one he would see. He would be living long enough to be able to see the Messiah come in person. Now, all of us, I think this is very fitting. All of us have celebrated uh, Christmas yesterday, right? Did we get some good stuff? Some good loot, right? Yeah, all right, that's good. I'm glad you guys had a good, did you guys eat a lot? How many calories, uh, Griffin? Are we eating? And you shouldn't be talking to church. Come on, man. What's going on? Um, how many calories do we eat on Christmas Day? 
Oh my gosh, he, he repeated it like 18,000 times yesterday. He's like, you know, Dad, you know how many calories we eat on Christmas Day? Uh, like around four or 5,000 calories. Uh, on, that's the average amount. I'd like to see the unaverage amount of the guy that goes all the way and just says, forget about it. I'm going to eat 10,000 calories. Man, I felt so full yesterday of all the different foods that we're eating. It was a wonderful uh, time. But here's what I'm getting at. I think it's very fitting that we're ending our series uh, on uh, Simeon uh, today after Christmas because a lot of these uh, songs of praise to God have been in the uh, coming of the Messiah. And this song is after after we've actually seen the Messiah. Simeon has seen the Messiah uh, after his birth. And so here's the big takeaway that I want us to all think about and to all remember. And this is one of the things that I'm reminded of time and time again. And Simeon is one of the first people to actually see this, to actually understand this, okay? When we think about Jesus coming in the flesh in his incarnation, how did God do it? How did God make this happen? How did God redeem his people? And the big takeaway from this passage, and we're, you're going to see this time and time again from the verses that we're going to be going through, is that to see Jesus is to see God's salvation. To see Jesus is to see God's salvation. When you actually behold Jesus and you see him for who he is, you will actually see and understand and come to understand God's salvation. And so turn with me uh, to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 22. We're going to go through this verse by verse, uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to kind of stop off here and there and talk about a few things that are going on. So in verse 22, one of the things that we see as a header for this passage, is that God's promises come to pass. God's promises come to pass. When we see Jesus, we see salvation. And how does God do this? Well, of all the prophecies, all the promises, all the predictions that the Old Testament makes, the Old Testament prophets make about the coming of the Messiah. So verse 22, and when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So there's a lot of things that you have to do whenever you uh, are an Old Testament Jew and you have a firstborn child. Just like when you have a baby for the first time, there's loads of things that you have to do. You know, you have to get, uh, you know, a crib and you have to uh, get clothing and you got to get the food and you got to get everything prepared. I remember when my kids uh, were first born, especially uh, my oldest one, you know, the first time he was born and it's like, you know, in the hospital and you're all nervous and scared and everything. And it's like, oh, well, at least you have nurses around you and doctors around around you. So if anything goes wrong, you can be like, hey, help me out. But then when that time comes to like leave, to like check out, and it's like, it's on you now. You know, you got to take care of this living creature. You know, this is not like a dog or, or a cat or, you know, a turtle. You know, this is like a real person that has real needs with a living soul. You got things that you got to take care of. And you get the the car seat and you put them in the car seat. And the car seat is like 13 times bigger than they are. And they fit into this little tiny bit. And then you put them in your car and you start to drive home. Have you ever driven home with a child for the very first time? That's the scariest thing in your whole life because like everyone like everyone is suddenly driving too fast everyone's suddenly too close everyone is giving you weird looks and you're like listen there's a kid back here and they're like what what are you what are you trying to say there's a kid back here you know and you're trying to drive home and you're driving very very slow just to make sure you don't like you know like bump anything Uh, I think it like what a normal drive for us was like 10 20 minutes to get home took us an hour to get home just because we're driving so slow to make sure you know everything is good in the rear view and everything it was really really scary there's loads of things that people had to do back then as well and if you were living according to the Old Testament law there's a few things that you had to do in verse 21 we learn that Jesus was uh, circumcised on the eighth day the eighth day is the normal day that all Jewish uh, boys would get circumcised the next thing is uh, 33 days later after that, that's when you were able to be presented at the temple. If you're a woman giving birth to a son, 40 days had to pass before you were allowed to go to the temple. If you gave birth to a, a girl, it was 80 days 
after that. And so they had to wait that amount of time before they were allowed to go to the temple to present themselves. And what would they do? They would present an offering to the Lord. Verse 23, it says, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Why would they do that? Well, it's that first one. They had to redeem back that child. So they would give an offering uh, to the Lord. It was typically a lamb, or if they were in a a financially destitute state, they could offer two birds, two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Well, what do we find out in verse 24? And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So what do we learn about Mary and Joseph? They weren't financially well off. You know, they weren't uh, middle class They weren't upper class. They were just very regular poor people. And the law made it possible for them to say, hey, if you couldn't even afford to give a lamb as your offering, you could give two turtle doves or two pigeons, which is what they did. And then uh, in verse 25, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon them, upon him. The interesting thing about Simeon is he's mentioned nowhere else in Scripture. He's only mentioned here. And what is he doing? He's waiting for the consolation of Israel. This is a messianic title about the coming Messiah. And he is waiting for that consolation of Israel. So what do we know about Simeon? We don't know a whole lot, uh, but we know a few things. We know one thing is he's waiting, just like Uh, many people were waiting. Now, a lot of people missed it. You know, a lot of people missed the coming birth, you know, uh, like Herod, you know, uh, he didn't know when he was going to come or what was going to go on. The scribes uh, didn't exactly know, but they knew obviously where he was going to be born. And so he was waiting for him. We also know he was a righteous man. He was a devout man. And we also know that the Holy Spirit was upon him. But here's the exciting thing in verse 26. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. So wouldn't that be a wonderful uh, sort of revelation to this person at this time where everyone had been waiting And for hundreds of years, there had been no revelation to God's people about the Messiah. And then all of a sudden, it's told to him, you won't see death. So what's one of the takeaways that we see from just this passage that we talked about, uh, or these few verses that we're talking about? The first one is that God's promises come to pass. All of God's promises always come to pass. His promises come to pass about Uh, many things, but uh, uh, specifically about this, about a divinely prepared person. You know, our Lord is the fulfillment of countless prophecies that pointed unmistakably to the Savior, who is Jesus Christ. And, you know, purposed in eternity past and promised in the scriptures, he came divinely prepared for the salvation of sinners just like you and me. But then we also see that he comes at an appointed time. We looked at this passage last week, but I'd like you to turn there now, if you could, with me, to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. You guys turn in there? you guys, are, you guys are finding it on your Bible app. That's why it's so, yeah, there you go. You guys are quick, man. You guys are quick. All right, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So when we see this word fullness, the fullness of time, it's this Greek word called pleroma. And it gives this idea of like when the, when the fullness, when something has become so full, it's just ready to burst. It's ready to overflow. It's come to the point where it has to come at this time. And we look at all these different prophecies and predictions pointing to the coming Savior. And when the fullness of time had come, when God had so architected the time for the Savior to be born, God sends forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Well, why is that important, born under the law? It's this fact that Jesus himself was able to fulfill every point of the law because we couldn't. 
You know, there's so many different rules, so many different regulations, so many different things that the Old Testament Jew had to keep and fulfill, but they were unable to do so except Jesus. And he's born under the law. Why? To redeem those that were under the law, to redeem all of us. His timing is perfect. But many times we have to wait. And this man, Simeon, who is waiting for this Savior to come, he is waiting. And, you know, uh, maybe people had given up. Many people would start to, you know, make fun or chide or deride uh, this person. Every day he would go to the temple waiting for the Messiah to come. And Simeon was faithful and consistent and waited for him to come. And we see that many times when we see these promises. Even God's people have to wait. They have to wait. But we know his promises will come to pass. So that's the first thing. The second thing we see, and starting in verse 27 all the way to verse 33, is that we see that God's salvation is for all. God's salvation is for all. So read with me in verse 27. It says, And he came in the Spirit into the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. So uh, we already mentioned a few of the customs of the law that they had to do in preparation for that. You know, circumcision, a time of purification, uh, a time of sacrifice. And many times, if it was this firstborn son, they would present the firstborn son uh, to the temple, but then they would redeem him back, buy him back for five uh, shekels of, uh, 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 of silver to the priesthood to buy back uh, this non-Levite child from the life of temple service, kind of redeeming them back. And this was a very common thing that many people did back then. Verse 28, he took him up in his arms and blessed him, saying, so we see Simeon, and he takes this newborn uh, baby, recognizing him as the promised one, and he starts to praise God. And this song of praise is what we call the nuke Demitis. Ugh, that's hard to say. The Nunc Demitis. And it's basically Latin. Uh, and most Latin songs, especially taken from the Bible, just takes the first couple of words of the song. So why we get the Magnificat, it's uh, we magnify uh, Jesus. The Nunc Demitis means uh, now his servant can depart. And it's taken from those two first words of the Latin uh, translation. So here's what it says in verse 29. It says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for the glory of your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. Now, we know that Joseph and Mary both know that Jesus is the Messiah. So they're not marveling at the fact uh, that this is kind of a reiteration of what has already been told to them. But what is uh, marvelous to their ears is the fact that here is a man that they barely even know, a very elderly old man who takes him up and begins to praise God through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, begins to praise God and exclaim what this child will do. He is salvation for all people, not just for the people of Israel. This is what many people uh, tend to think about the Messiah. Messiah would only come to save his people. Uh, the Messiah would only come to save them, and we've talked about this loads. Uh, they thought it was going to be a political uh, deliverer, you know, save me from the Romans, or save me from this empire. And it's like, yes, he will save, but he's going to save you from so much more, and obviously this is our own a sinful state. But then he goes a step further and says, this is going to be for everybody. It's not just for the Jews. It's also for the Gentiles. Well, this is exciting because this Savior is great enough and big enough to be able to save all peoples from their sins, as long as the salvation, once again, is only through Jesus Christ. Well, and for us to better understand this, especially during this time, when we think about the birth of Jesus, we really have to skip ahead to uh, the end of the story because in order for us to understand this passage, we really need to get to the Easter story. So if you could turn with me to Luke chapter 23, we're going to just read two verses, but hopefully it will help clarify uh, a little bit of things 
uh, for you, especially when we understand how massive and how important this was, what a radical shift this was for the Jewish mindset. You know, we have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we see that each gospel kind of focuses on a different audience. And one of the things that we see with Luke's gospel is it really uh, focuses on a world audience or a Gentile audience. Uh, and so Luke, uh, being a Gentile himself, is really letting everyone know that this Savior is not just for the Jews. As wonderful as uh, he is and uh, what he's come to do, he's also for the entire world. So Luke chapter 23, we're going to look at verse 44 and 45. It says, it was about the sixth hour, that's about 12 o'clock noon, and there was darkness over the whole land until about the ninth hour, that's about 3 p.m., while the sun's light faded and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. So now here's where we're getting at. Jesus is on the cross and he's between two uh, thieves. One of them is mocking Jesus and the other one is asking for Jesus uh, to save him. And so we have Jesus on the cross. He's lived his whole life a perfect and pure and righteous life, fulfilling all points of the law, doing everything necessary that was required of him to be under the law, and he lived it perfectly. And now he goes to a sinner's cross, uh, being blamed and being punished for sins that he never committed. And he's dying on behalf of us. And so now he's on this cross in between two different people. And as he's going through this agony, as he's going through the pain and suffering of being on this cross for all of us, and you can imagine being God himself, what is he thinking about? You know, there's so many different things. We don't know the mind of God, but we would obviously know that he's thinking of us. He's thinking of us. Each one, not just in a general sense, but in a very special and specific and personal sense. He's thinking of you. And it says around 12 o'clock, around midday, uh, it begins to get dark. And this isn't by some sort of eclipse or a few clouds. This is like that darkness. And darkness all the way throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, you know, it symbolizes God's judgment, God's uh, wrath upon sin. And it becomes very dark, and earthquakes are happening, and tombs are breaking open. And it's it's a real incredible and important time in world history. And it's dark for three hours. But it says at that time, the veil of the temple is torn in two. Now, what is it talking about with this curtain, this veil of the temple? Well, you know, when you have the temple complex, it's this huge, massive Thing And it was one of those uh, tourist attractions even back then 2,000 years ago because it was so ornate, it was so massive, it was so incredible that people from all over the world would make pilgrimages just to see this temple covered with gold, covered with silver, covered with brass, all sorts of different things. It was a very beautiful thing. And people would come in as this huge complex with many different uh, entranceways and rooms. And then you'd go into the temple itself proper, which only the priests were allowed to go into. And then you had the holy place. And then you had the most holy place, the holiest of holies. And no one was ever allowed to go in there except on one day of the entire year, which was Passover. And on that day, only the high priest could go into the holiest of holies to offer sacrifice, to offer incense, to offer prayers to God because this is where the very place God himself would reside. This is the very place that God himself, his presence was made known. And so you can imagine all the priests going in on this day to do their normal offerings. Jesus is only, you know, a few yards away being crucified on the place of the skull, the the Golgotha, Calvary. And during this time, it's getting dark. And you can imagine them doing their sacrifices. And you can imagine the high priest getting prepared to go in and to offer sacrifices for all of the nation of Israel. And yet when he goes to get ready to go in, 
the temple veil is already torn in two. This temple veil is anywhere from 60, 70, 80 feet tall. And it was very thick to have this huge veil. And it had gold inside it as well. And it was a very, very heavy sort of curtain. It's not something that you could just simply tear by yourself. And this veil is what kept the presence of God, of the holiest of holies, separate from the holy place from everyone else. And there was this firm distinction between where God is and where we are. And there's no going in between at all. And yet, because of what Christ did on the cross for each and every one of us, for mankind, he himself is the one that tore the temple in two because he knew that we couldn't do it, that we shouldn't do it, that we can't do it. Why? Because we're broken, we're dirty, we're stained. We have a sin debt. But through Christ, he tears that temple in two, which now signifies, and one of those things that we think about uh, of this uh, significance of this is what does that mean now for us? There's nothing now separating us from God through the person of Jesus Christ. We don't have to go to a third party. We don't have to go to a church. We don't have to go to a priest. We don't have to go to some other thing in order to get this redemption from God. We go to the person of Jesus Christ. He's the one that made a way for us to get to God himself. Now, why am I talking so much about this? Well, the only way we can understand the birth of Jesus is if we understand his death. You know, the only way we can properly understand Christmas is if we understand Easter. The only way we can understand how all of this ties together and why he came and his purpose and why Simeon himself is saying, listen, in you is salvation, not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles, for the entire world. In you is salvation for all. This is why when we talk about, you know, going from a cradle, many times we say he goes to the cross. To get to the heart of Christmas, we have to understand the meaning of Easter. All of history unfolds in the person of Jesus Christ. All of how we measure everything, including time itself, we see all these different prophecies predicting who the Messiah would be, being wounded, bruised, and crowned with thorns on our behalf. My question is, just like Simeon, you know, he's very old. These promises are coming to pass. And he's holding this little baby. And he's looking at this little baby And he says, in you is salvation. He recognized him as the redeemer. He recognized him as salvation. Do you recognize him as well? Do you look at Jesus and know him personally as your redeemer? Or are you looking to something else? Last two verses and then we'll uh, be done for the day. Uh, Turn back with me to Luke chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 34 and verse 35. What do we see here? It says, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. What are we talking about here? This is Simeon's song, Simeon's blessing, and now he turns to Mary and Joseph, and he says a few kind of cryptic sort of words, and you almost have to do a bit of study and and really think through, what is he talking about here, this rise and fall of many? You know, we see this Messiah, and what have we been hearing loads and loads about from all these different songs? You know, praise God, glory to God in the highest, you know, peace and goodwill towards everybody. You know, we see the birth of Jesus as a good thing, but now we see Simeon saying it's going to be for the rise and fall and for a sign that is opposed and a sword that will pierce through your own soul. What we see here is that Jesus' life and ministry will truly reveal our hearts. It's going to truly reveal who we are. It's going to truly reveal what side of the fence that we're on. It's going to show what are our real thoughts about the Messiah. 
You know, before uh, I, I continue on, this is something that even happens to us today. You know, we can talk about God all we want. We can talk about faith all we want. We can talk about spiritual things all we want. We can talk about eternity and life after death all we want. But the second that you mention the name Jesus, well, easy there. Well, things, things just got real serious, you know? Like, what are you talking about? Why are you bringing up Jesus? Now we're getting very specific and we're getting very, wait, wait, wait a minute, you're not one of those um, uh, fanatics, are you? You're not one of those crazy people, are you? You don't really believe the Bible as literal, do you? You know, this isn't just some sort of myths and, and uh, fairy tales and stories, is it? No, this is, this is something serious that we truly believe. And what does Simeon say? Hey, it is good news, but there's going to be some rising and falling. The fall, well, talking about those people that are arrogant and haughty in spirit, that reject Jesus. The rising, those are those people that uh, Jesus is going to look upon, that humbly follow who he is, and he picks them up. And the sign of opposition, well, this is what we see all throughout Jesus' life and ministry, and finally it culminates in him going to the cross. People opposed what he did. He did a lot of amazing, incredible things, and loads of people followed him for it, but a lot of people opposed him as well. And then Simeon gets very, very specific and looks to Mary and says, listen, a sword is going to pierce you as well. You know, um, when you think about Mary, who was at the foot of the cross, you know, many people watched Jesus die. And we read throughout the Christmas story and how Jesus, or sorry, Mary pondered these things in her hearts, was wondering what all of these things could mean. And she carried and treasured her, uh, these things all the way throughout her life until she gets to the foot of the cross. And she sees Jesus dying on the cross. And you could imagine the anguish and the agony that she went through as she saw someone that she raised, even though she knew he was the son of God, and even though she knew that he was the Messiah, the pain that she must have felt watching Jesus die on the cross. So what do we see as this takeaway with this section right here that Jesus' life and ministry reveals our hearts? What I mean by that is it's going to bring some division. It's going to bring some separation. Jesus' is coming is going to indicate some are going to reject and fall. Some are going to accept and rise. And this really shows where we're at concerning who God is. What's my point? My point is this. There is no neutrality with God. There is no neutrality with God. You're either for God or you are against God. Jesus himself said that uh, multiple times. You're either for me or you're against me. You're either with me or you're not. You know, a lot of times we like to talk about Jesus as a good teacher or a great moral example or a nice guy. Um, but truly, we can't just treat Jesus as that. Because either Jesus uh, was crazy, a lunatic, Someone who believed himself as God. If you were to meet someone like that today, you're like, hey, I'm God. And I've talked to a few people that said, hey, yeah, I'm God. I'm like, whew, all right. And then I slowly back away and I think, okay, uh, please do not spit on me. Uh, I'm going to go over here now. Either Jesus is a lunatic or he is a liar. He's a devious man who is actively trying to deceive people because he would know he's not God and he's just telling everyone else that he's not God. And so it's like either he's a liar or uh, he's crazy. Which one is it? And we say, well, neither of those because he is actually God. We can, there's no neutrality with God. Either he is the son of God or he isn't. And if he isn't, then he's something much worse. We can't just say, oh, he was a good guy. He was a nice person. He was a good uh, teacher. No, because a good teacher wouldn't be a liar. A good teacher wouldn't be crazy. Turn with me to Matthew 13. There's a few verses uh, I feel compelled uh, to read this morning because this really gets to the heart of the matter because Simeon himself, in blessing Jesus before Mary and Joseph, says, hey, some are gonna rise, some are gonna fall. There's gonna be a division amongst us. Jesus himself, in his own teaching, 
explains this in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24, uh, and we'll read just a few verses. It says, he put another parable before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. Then the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, do you not, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go gather them? He said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went, oh, sorry, I I jumped ahead uh, too far, Um, but then gather the wheat into my barn. So here's Jesus giving a parable, a very important parable. He says, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed good seed, but then an enemy came out and sowed weeds. Now, we don't know exactly what weed this would be, but a lot of people theorize it's this one called Darnell, which looks like wheat when it first starts, but then as it matures, it has very poisonous seeds in it. And it looks just like wheat when it's very, very young, but then as it matures, then it's very evident which one's which. And so what Jesus is saying is, hey, there's all of this good seed, good growth, but then there's bad seed, bad growth amongst them. Well, what is this signifying? Well, Jesus explains this parable himself in verse 36 and following, but I'll paraphrase it for you a little bit uh, for you this morning. What he says is, look, this is the world that we're living in. We live in a world where there's followers of God And there's people that hate God and don't want to have anything to do with them, the enemies of God. And there will be a time of judgment. There will be a time of reckoning. There will be a time where there will be that reaping of the harvest. It's not going to be now because we don't want to damage the the good seed. We're going to let everything grow together. But then at the end of days, at the judgment time, there will be a gathering of the harvest. And the good seed will be taken and gathered in the barn. The bad seed, it's going to be burnt. It's going to be thrown away. And this is that separation that God talks about time and time again. That Jesus is a very divisive character, a very divisive person, a very divisive God. Not in the sense of trying to sow division sakes for division sake, but we can't be neutral when it comes to God. We're either with God or we're against him. We're either for him or we're not. And if we're for him, it means that we accept his teachings and we want to follow him and we treat him as our Lord and Savior. If we're not, then we say, no, he is not the Lord and Savior. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to follow my own path. But then there's consequences to that as well. And Jesus says, this is the way that the world is. Which way are we going to go? I'm going to kind of close the way we started this whole sort of uh, talk with all of these different songs. We've been talking a lot about the Christmas story. And this is something that we do every single December because it's so important when we think about his first advent. You know, when we talk about advent, we're talking about the coming of Christ. And throughout the Bible, it talks about the two advents of Christ, his first coming and his second coming. And we talk about the fact that how many predictions about his first coming came true? All of them. Well, there's still loads of predictions and prophecies about his second coming. And how many of those are going to come true? All of them. And for us here in the world right now, when we think about his first coming, we think about when he was born in Bethlehem and how there was no room for him in the end. And I think about how in this day and age, many of us, we don't leave any room for Jesus in our lives. You know, we, we don't have any room uh, to, to let God work in our lives. We've gone through four different songs explaining who God is, what he did, what he came to do, how he redeems us. And we see the fact why we talk about this so much. 
Because to see Jesus is to see God's salvation. And for me now, am I going to be about that, about my father's business, or am I going to be against that? And I hope for all of us here this morning, we would uh, well consider what it means to be a true follower of Christ if you are a follower of him. But if you aren't a follower, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, then maybe today would be the day that you would do so. So if you could bow your heads and close your eyes, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer But before we pray, I want to give you a few moments in your own seat to really think and to pray and to give this time to the Lord. Maybe to pray to him yourself to speak to God. And then I'll give you a few moments and then I'll close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and thank you for every opportunity that we have to look at your word, to look at these passages, to look at the very words of you, um, how you've uh, written down a history of things that we need to know and the very factual things that have happened uh, 2,000 years ago. We're so thankful for Simeon and his faithfulness uh, of waiting for the coming Messiah and how you revealed to him how he would not die until the Savior uh, would arrive. And so we're so thankful for his song of praise. Uh, We're so thankful for uh, just the work that you've done, not only in his life, but then also we think 2,000 years later in the work of all of our lives bringing us here. We pray that uh, through these teachings and through uh, this song that we would uh, walk away changed individuals knowing and understanding uh, how important it is to see you, is to see your salvation, and how important it is to share that with those around us. And we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing our final song.
be seated. Thank you, Jessie. And just a few notices before we close the service today. Um, they're not on the screen. <laughs> At the offering, sorry. Um, so uh, our Christmas offering, um, if you are here in person and you'd like to use our offering box, it's over there by where Pastor Tal and Gus are. There's a black box if you wanted to give coins or cash. But um, if you'd like to give online, please go to our website, wellingchurch.com. All the details are on there for um, one-off payments, or you can set up direct debits. But through um, December, we are still giving to... Um, the church in North London, the All Nations Church. So any Christmas offerings, if you put in the uh, notes on the wellingchurch.com um, offering page, then all offerings will go to that church. Uh, we are still on our Christmas break. There aren't any clubs or anything going on until the 6th of January. Um, but, you know, if you have any questions about any clubs that are starting up for us or for the children, then please do grab one of the leaders after the service. And please do stay for teas and coffees. I know it's Boxing Day. Everybody wants to rush home for their families, but we have got tea and coffee. And some mince pies left, which really do need to be eaten. So please stay for those. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> 